The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, historian Eric Loomis on his book, A History of America in Ten Strikes, Author and organizer Jane McAlevey on her book, A Collective Bargain, Unions, Organizing, and the Fight for Democracy, plus Bill Press with never-Trump conservative Bill Kristol. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Historian Eric Loomis says if we truly want to understand the history of labor movements in the United States, look to the moments when workers went on strike. In this encore interview from 2018, Loomis reminds us of the powerful change that can happen when workers are willing to fight. And we say hello to Eric Loomis, an environmental and labor historian at the University of Rhode Island. His newest book from New Press is A History of America in Ten Strikes, described as a thrilling account of 10 moments in history when labor challenged the very nature of power in America. Eric Loomis, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Our pleasure to have you with us. You know, we hardly have time to go over all 10 moments, but we will start where you start, which is the Lowell Mill Girls' Strike in the 1830s. Tell us why you began with this story and what you want us to remember about this moment. Sure, a few things. You know, if we think about the history of American labor, uh, there's many different places we can we can start that, right? But if we're thinking about uh, telling the whole history of America through the uh, through the mirror, the, the window of strikes, this is a pretty sensible place to start. Or there's two sort of sensible places to start, actually. One is slavery, uh, which is the centerpiece of sort of early labor in America, and then also the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that's what the Lowell Mill Girl Strike is intended to do. So, you know, around 1794, you begin to see the first factories in the United States. And the labor conditions are really, really bad from the beginning. They use a lot of child labor, uh, very long hours. But this is actually considered kind of normal in some ways because most of these young people came off a farm and farm kids were used to working long hours. Over time, the factories get bigger, they get louder, and Americans are very worried. And by this, I mean people like Thomas Jefferson, for instance. He's very worried. What will factories do to America? Because he had a vision of America as an agrarian paradise of independent landowners, farmers. And they looked at what was happening in Britain and other parts of northern Europe where the Industrial Revolution had broken in, and the conditions were very, very bad. And so in Lowell, Massachusetts in the 1820s, there is an attempt to create a model town where you would bring in respectable workers, in this case, the young daughters of farmers, mostly, coming out of the farms of New England. They come there, they're going to work for a few years, and then they're going to get educated, they're going to have, there's going to be culture, and then they're going to go back home and get married. This is the kind of the ideal. And to some extent, they try to do this, right? So, you know, these young women might come from New Hampshire or Maine, and they come to Lowell Mass. And they work for a few years and Ralph Waldo Emerson comes and gives a lecture and they have their newspapers and they write poetry. And that all sounds great. Here's the problem. It was loud. It was uh, it was hot. It was the days were very long. People got hurt on the job. And over time, these young women say this work is really awful. And so they begin to form some of America's first labor unions, not the very, but some of the very first. And they use their power as, you know, not just the poorest of the poor, but as so-called respectable young women to protest against these terrible labor conditions. One of the first 
major strikes in American history. And so telling this, starting with that story does a couple of things. It shows how from the very beginnings of industrialization, workers have resisted the uh, unpleasant and dangerous parts of their work. And the other thing it does is it shows how women have always been central to the labor movement. Too often when we think about labor and we think about strikes, or even when we think about work, we think about men. And we think about men getting paid, men going on strike, but women have always worked. Much of that is unpaid labor in the home, but it's very important to center the experience of women, not only in our labor history and our history of work, but also in American history. And too often that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it, another interesting thing, you, you also include slaves during the Civil War. Does it surprise people some to hear about slaves striking? Yeah, often it does. Uh, you know, that. so the way I tell this story, it comes from, uh, you know, the, the, the great African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the founders of the NAACP. He did many wonderful things through his life. In 1935, publishes a book called Black Reconstruction. And in there, he talks about how slaves walked off the job during the Civil War in what he calls a general strike, which is a strike where everybody sort of stops working at the same time. This was totally unplanned. But what was really happening is that slaves were resisting their masters, and slaves had always resisted their masters. And so what happens is that when Union troops go into the South to fight the Civil War, slaves begin pouring toward Union lines. And, what, and this actually does very much to win the war for the North, because as we know, Abraham Lincoln wasn't really sure what to do about slavery when the war starts. In the North, the war isn't necessarily about slavery for a lot of people, but the slaves make it about slavery by forcing the Union's hand, because then they go to these union, the Union Army, and the Union Army has to say, well, what are we going to do with these people? And pretty quickly, what happens is they begin to say, OK, you know, we will bring these people in and have them work for us if they're enemy property. So we will have them, you know, we are confiscating their property. And this convinces slaves everywhere as soon as they can to start fleeing toward union lines. OK, so part of the problem, though, here is that we don't often think about slaves as regular workers. Right. But slavery is the point of slavery is not racism. Racism undergirds slavery. The point of slavery is a labor system. The point of slavery is to provide the cheapest labor possible. And that's what slavery ultimately did. Total worker control or excuse me, total employer control over these unpaid workers. Right. And so we have to see slaves as workers. And we have to see the history of slavery as a history of work. And what we have to see is the slaves walking off their job is not only resistance, but the most important labor action in American history as it ends the most unjust moment or the most unjust practice in all of American history. Fascinating. Uh, we're speaking with Eric Loomis. He's an environmental and labor historian at the University of Rhode Island. And his new book is A History of America in Ten Strikes. Moving ahead a bit in history, Eric, let's talk about the Flint sit-down strike against General Motors in the 1930s. Some describe it as one of the most important strikes in American history. What was significant about this strike? Sure. So the Flint strike is a strike of auto workers working for General Motors, and they use a innovative tactic uh, that was becoming kind of common in the 1930s um, and a little bit before that, too, in some areas. Uh, of just sitting down on the job instead of leaving. And the reason they would do that, the number one reason, is that if they, they knew that they walked off the job, that what would happen is that, uh, is that the employer, General Motors, would bring in strike breakers. And so what they decide to do is sit down on the job with the pretty smart, rational decision that General Motors is going to be far less likely to violently retake the plant because they could destroy the plant to do so. Okay, And so this works over time. And what it does is not only does it establish the United Auto Workers as a major uh, part of the American labor movement, but the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the mass industrial organizing that brings millions of workers into the American labor movement and really helps create the middle class in America over the next 20 to 30 years. But there's one thing that is often not talked about here, but I think is really, really important about this strike. 
The ways that American workers are able to win strikes is really only if they elect politicians who will use the government as a fair arbitrator between workers and employers. And in most of American history, that has not happened. Employers and the government have worked together to crush labor movements. That's what's going on today, right? And so what happens is that if American workers, angry at the Republican Party's response to the Great Depression and wanting a pretty radical change, had not elected Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932 over the Republican Herbert Hoover, this strike would not have succeeded. Moreover, if these very workers had not elected a really liberal governor by the name of Frank Murphy to be governor of Michigan, what almost certainly would have happened is what General Motors wanted, which was the governor of Michigan to call in the National Guard and take retake the plant by force. And so part of the story here is that if workers are going to succeed in the past or in the present, what they have to do is not only organize, but they also have to elect the politicians that are going to use the government fairly in labor disputes and not be basically the private army of employers. Hmm. The Lordstown strike in 1972, again against General Motors, has somewhat a notorious history for how the union collaborated with management. What happened? Sure. So, so by the 1960s, you know, so well, let, me, let me go back a little bit. So the 1940s, 1950s, you know, you have the very people who won that Flint strike and other General Motors and auto workers, and they are, you know, they're, they're moving in the middle class, right? They're getting more money. They have good wages. They have good benefits. They're taking vacations. They get retirement pay, et cetera. But I got to be honest, the job's not very much fun. Working in an auto factory was basically being a machine. And uh, what had happened by the, by the early 1970s, right, you have the 60s, the Vietnam generation, a lot of youthful discontent, and a lot of those, uh, you know, factory workers from the 1930s and 40s were retiring. And so GM was hiring a whole bunch of new people in, the Youngstown, in this plant in Lordstown, Ohio, which is near, near Youngstown. Um, and at the same time, GM was, uh, was working uh, to try to compete in the small car market. Uh, with these Japanese cars that were starting to enter the market, right? And so they're creating this, this car called the Chevy Vega. They didn't really believe in it. And so they create this plant in, uh, in, in, in uh, excuse me, in Lordstown. They have this very young workforce, and they try to make money off of this pretty cheap car by driving the workforce as hard as they can. They speed up the work. They mechanize the work. And it's really very unpleasant work. And you have a 60s generation saying, you know, we don't want to be our fathers and live for 30 to 35 years doing the same thing. The problem was here is that the United Auto Workers was still really controlled by the same generation who had organized it 35 years earlier. And so you have a bunch of old guys in Detroit and a bunch of young workers in, in Ohio, and they're clashing too. And so what happens when they go on strike is that they is that the auto workers and GM both try to manage this strike to get the workers back on the job and not really solve any of these problems. But you know, at the same time, the problems that the Youngstown workers, uh, the Lordstown workers faced in part was that they just hated the job. How do you negotiate that into a union contract? And right. so a lot of that strike at Lordstown was just being angry, and that and that, that put the UAW in a tough position. But they didn't really respond very well either. So, you know, the union movement by the 70s was not as was not as robust as it could have been. Mm -hmm. You know, you also included air traffic controllers in the book, a moment we will remember, most of us anyway, because of the role of Ronald Reagan and perhaps uh, may have been a turning point for unions. Would you agree? Well, yes. I mean, it's not the only turning point, but it's the most prominent. I mean, by the 70s, what you see is corporations uh, really seeking to retake control of the government uh, from the liberals who have more or less kind of controlled it for the past few decades, right? 70, by the 60s and 70s, you see, you know, labor unions doing well, environmental regulations getting passed, consumer regulations getting passed, and conservative business people began to organize in the 70s to resist this. And Ronald Reagan became a front person for them. And then when he gets elected to the presidency in 1981, He's not, you know, Reagan himself had not had a particularly anti-union past, but the air traffic controllers were, honestly, they were kind of jerks. 
uh, they, uh, you know, they would shut down the airlines at any given time, like Thanksgiving or Christmas, throwing the plans of millions of people up in the air. Uh, and they didn't consult with other unions either. And in fact, they endorsed Ronald Reagan for the presidency because most of the men in that union, it was a white male union, and they were pretty politically conservative. But they went on strike in 1981 thinking that because they controlled the air, that there was nothing the government could do. And Reagan goes in and he fires them all, even though they had supported him. And what that does is it tells private industry that they can start busting unions too. And so through the 80s, building on what happened in 1981, you have corporations going and just destroying unions they had had for 40 years, really decimating private sector unionism, and it has not recovered to the present. So yes, mm-hmm. absolutely a huge turning point in our history. Yeah. We're get, again, we're speaking with Eric Loomis, environmental and labor historian at the University of Rhode Island. His newest book from New Press is A History of America in Ten Strikes. Another strike this one not in the book, but which you have written about is the prison worker strike, which recently ended in an op-ed in the New York Times. These are hardly workers represented by a union. What do you hope these workers can achieve? Well, the reality is, is that prison, so prison labor is a huge part of our economy and we don't even recognize it. There are, there are hundreds of thousands of workers every day who are laboring uh, for almost nothing. And every one of those workers who is laboring for uh, almost nothing uh, is not only being exploited, but they're also uh, it also undermines the uh, the labor sector for the rest of us. Why would if you're an employer, why would you hire non prison workers and pay them even the minimum wage when you could pay them, you know, three dollars a day? Right. And so this is a huge part of our economy. And these workers don't really have much of a choice. And, of course, part of the prison system is tremendously uh, it, you know, it's tremendously too, too big anyway. It exploits especially people of color. In fact, really in, in this op-ed for the New York Times, I connect it back to slavery because through America, all of American history, white people have demanded free labor from people of color. This is central to our history, not only African Americans, but also Native Americans, Latinos. And, uh, this, this, this is a reality of our history. And so these strikers, these people, it's very hard to organize in the prisons. Uh, because they don't have access to the basic tools of freedom that the rest of us do. But what they have done is brought the first real major attention to prison labor in a long time. And I think that that is very important. In the 70s, there was a similar kind of strike. And what that eventually helped lead to was the attention necessary to throw out as unconstitutional a labor system in Texas prisons that forced people to force prisoners to work in segregated uh, work gangs in cotton fields for no money at all, right, which is effectively slavery. And so uh, and, and so hopefully what this prison strike does is gather the attention necessary to reform this prison labor system and treat people like humans, not like slaves. Mm-hmm. As you look at all these stories, what are the common themes and lessons that emerge there are two major, three major themes. Okay. One is that whether there's a labor movement in terms of unions or not, whether the government is going to allow unions to be successful or not, workers will always fight back for what they think is right. Okay. So Republicans could destroy the American labor movement. That's their goal. They may well do so, but workers will continue to struggle, just like we've seen in these teachers in West Virginia and Oklahoma and other states this past spring and probably starting again here in the fall uh, of 2018. Um, this, the second lesson uh, is that, to go back to what I said about Flint, is that workers to succeed have to cre- elect the politicians that will use the government in at least a neutral manner. There's almost no examples of American workers successfully organizing for a union if the government is on the side of the employer. So the political game is something that workers have to play. And third, and this is a little more depressing, is that the biggest thing getting in the way of worker solidarity throughout American history is racism. Too often in American history, the white working class chooses its white interests over its class interests. People often say, well, why do these workers vote against their interests? 
for instance, white workers voting for Donald Trump. They're not voting against their interests. They're voting for their white interests. And until the white working class understands that it, that they are destroying their ability to succeed if they vote based on their racial prejudice instead of their class interest, it's very hard for, for American labor to succeed. And so part of what we have to do is have a very strongly anti-racist labor movement if we're to overcome this. Mm hmm. Uh, you know, the history of the labor movement is certainly a contested space, often influenced by the subjectivity of, of prevailing powers. What are some of the common myths about these labor struggles and why is it so important to get the history right? Sure. I mean, you know, a lot of these myths about the labor struggles actually oftentimes are on the left. You know, it's that workers came together and they showed solidarity and they won. And if only union leaders were more radical, they would win, too. Uh, and, you know, these labor union leaders today are sellouts, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, and that's actually a very pervasive myth, particularly on the left. Um, and I think it's very important to get the real history. And, and to some extent, this book is written for people who are already kind of liberal or activists to make them smarter, basically, to get them the real history of how workers have organized or not organized in order to use these tools of organizing effectively, right? And so if we come into organizing or democratic politics with myths, with myths about how things have happened, then we're going to look back and we're going to say, why aren't these labor union leaders like those great labor union leaders of the 1930s, right? That we fail because we don't have these great labor leaders of the past. But the reality is, is that most of those labor leaders of the past weren't that great either. And that if we can understand the real reasons why unions succeed or fail, then we can have a smarter progressive movement that organizes more effectively, stops with mythology that is self-destructive, and moves ahead in an effective, strong, and smart manner to help fix all the many problems in this country. The name of the book, A History of America in Ten Strikes, Ten Moments in History When Labor Challenged the Very Nature of Power in America. And the author, Eric Loomis, environmental and labor historian at the University of Rhode Island, who's joined us today on America's Democrats podcast. Eric, thank you very much. Really enjoyed talking with you about it today and look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thank you very much for having me. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, why a longtime union organizer is calling on unions to defend our democracy. But first we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his Common Sense Commentary. As a writer, I get stuck every so often straining for the right words to tell my story. 
Over the years, though, I've learned when to quit tying myself into mental knots over sentence construction, instead stepping back and rethinking where my story is going. This process is essentially what millions of American working families are going through this year, as record numbers of them are shocking bosses, politicians, and economists by stepping back and declaring, we quit. Most of the quits are tied to very real abuses that have become ingrained in our workplaces over the past couple of decades. Poverty paychecks, no health care, unpredictable schedules, no child care, understaffing, forced overtime, unsafe jobs, sexist and racist managers, tolerance of aggressively rude customers, and so awful much more. Specific grievances abound, but at the core of each is a deep, inherently destructive, executive suite malignancy, disrespect. The corporate system has cheapened employees from valuable human assets worthy of being nurtured and advanced to a bookkeeping expense that must be steadily eliminated. It's not just about paychecks. It's about feeling valued, feeling that the hierarchy gives a damn about the people doing the work. Yet, corporate America is going out of its way to show that it doesn't care. And, of course, workers notice. So unionization is booming. Millions who were laid off by the pandemic are refusing to rush back to the same old grind. And now millions who have jobs are quitting. This is much more than an unusual unemployment stat. It's a sea change in people's attitude about work itself and life. This is Jim Hightower saying people are rethinking where their story is going and how they can take it in a better direction. Yes, nearly everyone will eventually return to work, but workers themselves have begun redefining the job and rebalancing it with life. Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. In her most recent book, Jane McAlevey makes the case that unions are a key institution capable of taking effective action to reset power and politics in America and clear a path to progressive change. And we say hello to Jane McAlevey, an organizer, author, and scholar. She's currently a senior policy fellow at the University of California at Berkeley's Labor Center, part of the Institute for Labor and Employment Relations. Jane's most recent book, A Collective Bargain, Unions, Organizing, and the Fight for Democracy. Jane McAlevey, thanks so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. It is my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Well, our pleasure to have you with us. This new book won a starred review from Publishers Weekly. That's a rare accomplishment, and congratulations to you. Um, In their review— Thank you. You're quite welcome. Publishers Weekly called the book, quote, a persuasive argument that the power of strong democratic trade unions can fix many of America's social problems, close quote. What puts labor unions at the center of progressive change? Uh, you know, I think a few things. One is, if you look at just the last two years, since there's been sort of a revival of mass collective action, meaning these really large strikes we're having, primarily in the education sector, though not just not just in the education sector, which is important. Um, you know, I think what you see is the American public standing up and rallying. Uh, behind a fairly beleaguered institution, by the way, known as the teaching profession, right? That's been under extremely serious attack for 20 years. And despite that, what we realize when the workers decided to, you know, take the future of the education system into their own hands and walk off the job to demand that it, it return to being a better education system that we once had in this country when it was well-funded um, before the, you know, right wing and the, and, and the people with the tax cuts began attacking our education system, you see the extraordinary support and solidarity that's breaking out all over the United States. So that's like, to me, one example of why both unions matter and can get us out of the mess that we're in is several fold. One is fundamentally people in this country do break 
in a solidaristic way with each other. Like, yes, we have a problem with white nationalism, but most people in this country break in a way that breaks towards human solidarity when they see workers standing up for themselves. And we need a lot more of that in this country, both because we need more solidarity, like an active solidarity right now, um, and because we definitely need workers standing up for themselves. So part of what I try and say in the book is if you look at the current, if you look at two things, which are not going to be unfamiliar to your listeners. One is the current state of the U.S. Supreme Court. And by the way, not just the Supreme Court, like the federal judiciary at this point, right, has been stacked with more extreme right wing justices than certainly ever in my lifetime. Um, And then in addition to that, you've got, you know, the sort of series of Supreme Court decisions that have made it that dark money is really running our political system. And that's not going to get undone anytime soon. So As an organizer and a strategist, when I look around at what's available to ordinary Americans to fix the mess called the United States right now, there's one thing left, which is strikes and trade unions and people demanding in the workplace what we deserve because our democracy, the democratic institutions that have long governed this country are hugely broken right now. And to reset them, I think it's going to take you know, in 2020, 2022, 2024, 2025, six, seven, this entire coming decade is going to take what it took in the 1930s to reset political power and balance in the United States. And that took workers mm-hmm. in large numbers walking off the job. Well, and, you know, and in, in, in specifically thinking of the teachers strikes that we've seen, um, and, and again, not exclusively to, to education, but it's not just about their pay. It's about the At whole all. system, yeah. and I think that's where you're really starting to pick up some steam and getting some people that are maybe out on the fringes or don't even know anything about it, saying, "Hey, you know that doesn't, you know that's not right. We these these folks need help, and 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 they get the support that way." Yeah, that's right, and and and, and that's an important point you're making because it reflects the same the education strikers. I'm just going to call them education because it's bigger than just teachers, but it's. But these teachers and educators with them who are walking off the job are doing it in a way where they're making very clear that their demands list is a great education system. It's, it's the schools every kid deserves, right? That's the theme throughout the education strikes is educators striking to demand a rebuild of the public education system to the point where, and again, just to state the obvious, like good the way it was when it was more robustly funded before the 1980s and decades of tax cuts came. You know, when I went to public school, I had, we had a full-time nurse in our school. We had before uh, school started sports and athletics. We had after school started sports and athletics. We had art every single day and gym every single day and a nurse and a librarian, and a guidance counselor. Do you know how few schools have that right now? And that's one reason only, which is the super rich and the corporate elite of this country pocketing all the money that used to go to places like to fund art classes and guidance counselors and school nurses. Literally the difference between the late 1970s and early 1980s when I was still a public high school student and today is that there's a bunch of money lining the already bulging pockets of the super rich. And that has got to be reversed in this country. And I honestly, my read as both an organizer in the trade union sector and a contract negotiator, but also like I've run political campaigns, environmental campaigns, like my entire life uh, experience and then my PhD work and my postdoc work at Harvard have all confirmed for me there really is no other way out of the mess that we're in in this country of extreme polarization fueled by a sort of faux populist right unless and until workers begin to stand up for themselves again in really large numbers and do it in a way that the teachers are doing it, meaning message the broader community that this, this fight we're having is not about our wages. It's about our wages, right? Like the entire country's wages. Like every fight right now is about a fight for the, for the, for the future of this country. Absolutely. And you brought something up. Let's talk about the historical context for the book. It's decades of a concerted effort by folks that you brought up earlier, corporate class and the willing politicians uh, willing to suppress the labor movement in the U.S. What do you consider the most damaging impact of that effort that we're living with today? You know, I, I think I think one that's becoming more and more familiar to people, and it's in part thanks to the candidacies of people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and 
you know, the sort of non-corporate Democrats are, people are actually talking again about the single biggest blow. There was one massive blow, which was the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947. And that was the act that was passed um, to roll back the clock on the gains that American workers were making, right? So I break the book, there's a history chapter in the book, and I break it, I break it down into three three waves of attacks on American workers. One was the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 that sort of presaged and began the Cold War period. The second was what I call the weaponization of globalization. Like when I look back in history, I think, frankly, when we all look back at history, we're going to realize that this thing called globalization was nothing but union busting, which is what I argue in the book. Like it really served no function except to break unions in the sort of industrial West in the United States and Europe, et cetera, um, and to offshore every decent unionized job from Germany to France to England to the United States to Canada to some place where workers have no rights and something much closer to slavery um, exists. And that is a large part of the world, quite frankly, right? When you're locked into a factory, a Foxconn factory making iPhones in China, by the way, you have zero rights. You you have no rights. So that that corporation decided to offshore all of the best paying unionized jobs all over the world um, to me is going to be understood as nothing but wave two of massive union busting. And then the third wave began essentially with the 2010 midterms. Um, a lot of work on the part of the, I think often smarter than the Democrats or smarter than the progressives, like the super right wing in the form of the Koch brothers, you know, that ilk, Karl Rove, the, the crowd that's been dominating the political discourse and really, frankly, out muscling or out, outsmarting a lot of the progressives is that they, they, did, they focused for like 20 years on the census and taking state legislatures when they got them, which they needed to undo the public sector, which most Americans don't understand. So I'm just going to get the three waves clear for you, is that they had to find a way into the states because public sector labor law is governed state by state, not by one federal law, the way the National Labor Relations Act is. So in three, so 2010 marks the beginning of the third wave, which is like the vociferous, brutal attack on the public sector units that we've been seeing, right? Sustained attacks since 2010. So three big waves, 1947, attack on all unions. Um, that's the Taft-Hartley Act. And then I pinpoint it to like 73, 72, 73, 74, the beginning of a concerted um, effort at offshoring jobs in a really massive way, not just a little plant, a little plant, a little plant, but going, like going. Um, and, and the sort of architecture and the narrative of neoliberalism taking hold in the United States. And then 2010 begins the, what we call like the final offensive, right? Like in the mind of the Koch brothers, they are damn close to wiping unions out in this country. We are down to a, you know, less than 6% in the private sector and less than 11% overall. So those are pretty terrifying numbers, except if you realize, which we should part, but this part on a positive note, those were the same numbers in 1932, right? Mm, and then the biggest yeah. growth in unions ever happened essentially overnight. Like you could see a scenario where a non-corporate Democrat wins the White House and behaves the way Roosevelt did, right? An unconventional president wins the presidency. It's, it's a remote possibility. And I don't mean unconventional like a white nationalist, like the one we have. I mean, unconventional in a good way. Uh, wins <laughs> right. the presidency, right? I mean, we've got I an unconventional I was, lunatic. I, I think I was safe in assuming what you meant on that one. <laughs> I know, I yeah. know. But, you know, like yeah. I just, so I, the, the important thing for listeners is American unions were this down in the dump at the end of the 1920s. And that period feels a lot to me like, like, the, like that, like the late 1920s and the very early 1930s does feel similar in a lot of ways, not just in the U S but in the global historical moment we're in of like strong men, authoritarianism, Trump, like racist, white nationalist, anti-immigrant characters, you know, all over the place winning office, by the way, not winning legitimately, by the way, but like, right. I should say, becoming the quote unquote elected leaders um, yeah. in many a country. So the periods are the, the feel around the world. I'm working a lot in Europe now. It feels a lot like the United States. Unions are under attack. Working class people are under attack. You know, people are getting the, the, the sort of elite, you know, have merged across the top of all the political parties um, and they're ruling themselves, you know, and unless, unless 
people in this country start to stand up for themselves again, uh, we're going to be in a lot more trouble. But I think if people stand up for themselves right now, as we're seeing people doing, we have a real shot at turning this whole thing around in a pretty profound way. We're speaking with Jane McAlevey. Uh, She is a senior policy fellow at the University of California, Berkeley's Labor Center, part of the Institute for Labor and Employment Relations. And her latest book is A Collective Bargain, Unions Organizing and the Fight for Democracy. And and Jane, now kind of turning the focus to the current context of the book, is that unions are making a comeback. Why now? Is it more than just the strikes? I think, you know, I think the strikes are reflective of the absolute state of despair that most of Americans find themselves in, to be honest. And um, and that's what I mean about it feeling a bit like 1930 and 31 and 32 um, in this country right now. Right. I mean, people there was like one in four people were unemployed in the Great Depression. I'm arguing in the book that the same level of misery exists right now. It's just more it's not as It's not as easy to see because you can't just say one in four are unemployed. What you can see if you're like me out in the field as a union organizer is people running to like make five different jobs make sense. And they're working 90 hours stitching together five different kinds of pay systems and they're falling behind. And it's both parents working, not one. And frankly, people are committing suicide, right? Our birth rate is going down. I mean, there is a there are very serious things wrong in this country, very serious things wrong. And people really like once you get out of like a major urban area and even if you're in it, if you keep your eyes wide open in a certain way, you will just see the level of misery that's going on in this country. People are realizing that the system is horribly skewed against them. Um, the tax, the most disgusting of all the tax cuts, the most recent one, right, in 2017 under Trump, just the super rich get a giant tax break. I just, I think people have had it. I mean, to put it yeah. bluntly, I just think people have had it. And the question is, are we going to trend in a right-wing populist direction or are we going to trend in a progressive populist direction? And I think the unions that have led those big strikes are pulling us in the direction of a more progressive form of populism, just like they did in 1932 and 33, right? I mean, we didn't get the big benefits from FDR's administration. I mean, we got relief, right, from insanity the minute he took over, which we could get again if someone good won. Just relief from like, are we going to war tomorrow in Iran? You know, I mean, we need relief from a lot of pain right now. But to turn the whole system around, it took FDR another three years. And it took... It took workers, by the way, striking like crazy in 33 and 34. And I lift that up a lot in the book because I think people forget. Like they think, oh, FDR, the New Deal, things just got good for the average worker. You know, there were massive, massive strikes that happened in 32, 33, 34, right up until 35 when he began, when, when Congress began, you know, forced by a level of strike activity in this country that was bringing, frankly, corporations and the capitalist class kind of to its knees legislatively, because that's what big strikes can do. And I'm arguing we're going to have to do a whole lot more of them before we can imagine bringing the power imbalance back to something somewhat fair in this country, right? Income inequality is a reflection of power inequality. And the power inequality is it, we're trapped right now, given the political, like the fit campaign contribution system in politics is so broken. Everyone knows that the Supreme Court is only recently broken. People are just starting to understand how broken our court system is about to be. And again, he's got all those federal judiciary judges stacking every single one of the federal district courthouses right now, not just the Supremes. And if you take those two things together, I am sorry, but I see no other. I mean, I've done again, I've worked every part of the progressive movement in this country. I was a community organizer, an environmental organizer, a political campaigner, and then found my home, my whole life home, you know, in the labor movement. And I I don't think there's any way out. And as an organizer, I've had the experience even just in the last couple of years of like winning, working with workers to win contracts that are literally life changing, that change the entire life of the family and depending on how big the facility is, the whole community around them. And that kind of rebalancing of economic and political power is going to come through strikes.
All right, Jane McAlevey, organizer, author, scholar, senior policy fellow at the University of California at Berkeley's Labor Center. Again, her most recent book is A Collective Bargain, Unions Organizing and the Fight for Democracy. Jane, we appreciate your time with us today on the America's Democrats podcast and hope to have you back real soon. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press with journalist and author Bill Kristol on what it will take for Republicans to break free from Donald Trump. Uh, So, Bill, you and um, others like the Lincoln Project were successful in your goal of preventing Donald Trump from getting a second term. What's the goal now? So I, I, I'm glad we helped. We contributed to that outcome. We weren't very successful in liberating the Republican Party from Donald Trump, um, either in the primaries in 2020 or in the general election, where Republicans did pretty well. They paid not much of a price, I think you could say, for being the party of Trump. Uh, they gained House seats and 150 Senate seats. And since, amazingly, since January 6th, when you would have thought people finally had enough, and some people to their credit did, like Liz Cheney, um, you know, most Republicans have sort of decided ah, it's, it's OK and they don't love Trump, some of them, but they, they want to not alienate the Trump supporters. Some Trump supporters have gotten crazier than ever and some people who hadn't been entirely crazy have gone even crazier. So <laughs> it's a pretty grim scene, honestly. I mean, you, I think I did not expect this depth of radicalization, extremism irresponsibility, demagoguery in the Republican Party. I mean, I was, and I think it is such a depth that you can't count on it to govern in any in any which way. And I, I'm very struck that Liz Cheney has come to that conclusion. I mean, people haven't noticed enough that she not only said, uh, you know, she wants to find out what happened on January 6th and before, she not only said that she wouldn't vote for Trump again, she said she wouldn't, I think she said she wouldn't vote for Kevin McCarthy for speaker because he himself has been so mm-hmm. complicit in the of so what Trump has been trying to do. So she, yeah. I give her a lot of credit for taking, uh, you know, t- taking her own conclusion seriously and, and thinking them through logically. And I do think, for me, that's the conclusion, that the current Republican Party just can't be trusted to govern. doesn't mean any individual Republican shouldn't be elected to the House and the Senate necessarily, or maybe, you know, Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland or something. But, um, but as a party, it is not a reliable partner in guiding this democracy, which puts a huge burden on the Biden administration to succeed, I think. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, that they, it's really important, I think, for the country that, but, but I don't mean succeeds in everything he wants to do, but generally speaking, be a successful administration so the Democratic Party can remain a, a successful and serious governing party. What would it take? What would it take to, to break the Republican Party from Trump uh, and get back to what it was when you and I were out debating as a Democrat and a Republican? <laughs> You know, it's a, I don't know, you know, how politics is. You don't know until you, you're powerful until people test your power and defeat you, which is why the Cheney election in Wyoming is so important, uh, the primary. I went to Philadelphia last week and did a little event for someone who actually I've known for a long time, Craig Snyder, running as a non-Trump Republican in the for the Senate, in the Pennsylvania Senate race, with, I think, four or five Trump Republicans. He's an underdog. He's not that well known, very good, very good resume, but... Um, but, you know, it'll be interesting to see if someone like him could catch on a little. It turns out there's a market for a more old fashioned, you know, Dick Thornburg, John Hines, uh, Pennsylvania Republican, uh, for maybe 20%, 30% of the party. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that's the case or whether it just becomes a Trumpist battle and uh, about who can be the most demagogic about who can refuse to accept the election returns, who could be the most demagogic about Afghan refugees and, and so forth. So I think we'll see. We'll have a lot of tests of this in the primaries in 2022, just as we'll have a lot of tests of where the center balances in the Democratic Party in 2022. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because there is certainly an effort on the part of the Trump supporters, the the Trump PACs, uh, 
uh, to ad identify and go after and try to defeat any Republican who dared criticize Donald Trump or break with him in any way. Liz Cheney is one of the targets. Li Lisa Murkowski, obviously, is another one. Uh, Brian Kemp in, 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 in Georgia. So either governor or senate or congressional candidates. Um, is there a parallel effort to um, identify those who have stuck with Trump and try to defeat them, particularly those, for example, who voted to overturn the Electoral College vote on Janu January 6th? Yeah, I mean, of course, that would be the majority of the House Republicans. Oh, that's true. Now, there will be primary challenges, and I've talked to several of these people, and we'll try to help them a little bit, uh, against some of the most egregious Trumpists, the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Lauren Boberts and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be tough in those districts, but I think it's worth showing the flag. And there will be open seats and redistricted seats uh, and open seats even in the Senate where I think it's less it's it's less uphill, you know, where they just have a, a, an open seat race and maybe a more traditional Republican, especially one who hasn't been never Trump but isn't really pro-Trump and just wants to get beyond Trump, he would have a reasonable chance. And so I, the party could end up in a horrible place in, you know, 14 months. It could end up in a, you know, not great, but not terrible place. It could end up in a decent place. But I don't know, the degree to which everyone feels compelled to sort of accommodate the uh, craziness on the right is pretty is pretty worrisome. And the degree to which, and I hold the Republican elites really responsible for this, the degree to which the Republican elites are willing to tolerate that and therefore, they never really make anyone pay a price, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, that's what really makes this possible. So, if you're Kevin McCarthy, you think, you know, I can kind of straddle. I can be totally irresponsible at the election. I can just duck on vaccines. I can let Liz Cheney be purged and have Elise Stefana come in saying just unbelievable things. But I can also privately tell the business guys that I'll watch out for their interests and, and stuff. And I can get along, you know, I can sort of manage this thing in a way that maybe makes me speaker. So, I, I think until someone says, no, it's not acceptable for you to be even, uh, you know, not just fanning the flames, but even sort of tolerating the kind of demagoguery that's going on that you need to really denounce it, at least sometimes, uh, it's going to be hard to, 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 to rein that in. Well, you mentioned Kevin McCarthy. It's a, uh, I find it curious that Kevin McCarthy, the one person who's been purged, right, is Liz Cheney. Right. Uh, but nothing about Matt Gates or Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Bobbert or Mo Brooks or go down the list. Andy Clyde, right, who said some outrageous things and Mo Brooks even saying he understood why the guy brought his pickup truck with a bomb here to the Capitol last week. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And McCarthy, total silent on that. I mean, you must have known Kevin back in California, right? I mean, it's it's kind of amazing, isn't it? It is. It is. I mean, he's so obsessed, it seems with uh, being speaker, right, that he'll put up with uh, anything rather than lose one potential vote for speaker. By the way, I mean, this is a little tangent, but I don't think he'll ever be speaker. I, huh. uh, even no matter how close he sticks to Trump, I think given a chance that the uh, the really hardcore Republicans will will, uh, uh, will not support him, like, like the last time they didn't support him either, right? So um, how, how about... Donald Trump himself, do you see him as the inevitable candidate in 2024? I mean, you watch him at one of these rallies. He's not that impressive. He, you know, a lot of his, uh, he's a little older, first of all. And a lot of that oomph came from being president and Air Force One and all the kind of hoopla. Uh, having said that, he still can turn out like a lot more people than anyone else can. And he's uh, way ahead in the polls. And a lot of the others will be nervous about challenging him. So, you know, if you had to bet, you'd say he's more likely than anyone else. But I, I don't think it's inevitable. And again, it's a, it's a long time in politics, obviously. And so um, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I wish I could say much more certainly that no way. You know, after January 6th, the correct answer, if the Republicans were a healthy party, the correct answer to your question after January 6th would have been zero chance. No way. Out of the question. And that's certainly not, it would have been like asking if Richard Nixon could be the nominee in 19, you know, 77 or 78. It's like, no, he might get a little rehabilitated, but he's not going to be like a nominee. You know? uh, and so I'm mean, leaving aside the two-term thing and everything, but um, or Spur Agony or something. But, you know, uh, with, with Trump, he's, he's, he's there and they're paying court to him and various state chairmen, the degree to which the Trumpists 
if all the idiocy of it, they're pretty uh, determined and somewhat organized. And so they do take over state parties and county parties. Oh, yeah. And uh, committee, county committees, and so forth, and so it's not like they have no power down at the grassroots level. And and you see this in school board uh, elections, and also in the meetings. And you think again, you look at one of those these people screaming and yelling in the really terrible way, and and you think, okay, surely that turns off their fellow citizens. But Mm-mm. I don't know, maybe not. Doesn't seem to. But even even though nobody will say uh, I'm going to run against Trump, there's still a gaggle of Republicans out there who clearly are positioning themselves to run if he doesn't, right? And we're talking about the Ron DeSantis right. and the Ted Cruz and the, um, go, go down the list, I guess maybe even Nikki Haley or Greg Abbott's of this world, Josh Hawley's. Um, do you see, is any one of them, do you think, the likely nominee if Trump is not? By the way, I should have mentioned Mike Pence. <laughs> How could yeah, I forget well, Mike Pence? I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, and I... <laughs> Who knows? It's so um, it's so you know such so cra- crazy and unpredictable. I think in principle, DeSantis or someone like DeSantis, another governor who's pro Trump but not too associated with Trump, didn't have to defend him much because he wasn't in Congress. Can the business guys can look at him and say, "Well, look, he governed a big state and made some mistakes." Yeah. Now, I think DeSantis looks stronger three months ago that he does today with with what's happening down there with COVID. And uh, maybe one of the other governors will emerge who's less less uh, well-known now or, or even just uh, so someone who becomes governor next year or something. Um, pretty hard to tell, I, I think. You know, look, look at Trump's emergence in 2015, 2016. So, uh, I mean, if Trump runs, I think there'll be fewer challenges. It'll be more of a – there'll be someone who's really not, not Trump and then someone who's kind of in between not Trump and Trump and maybe one or two other people in Trump. Well, if it's a, if Trump doesn't run, it will be totally wide open. And I'm sure, I mean, I think Marjorie Taylor Greene, all those people will try. Why not? You know, and they won't get no votes, right? I mean, if it won't hurt them, you know, they'll just increase their ability to, to, uh, you know, get people's money through email and sell books they didn't write and so forth. So, I mean, the degree to which it's become a giant money making machine, a grift machine, as well as a, uh, you know, a pathway to celebrity uh, on the right. People don't quite, people who aren't in that world, I'm not in it, but I still know a few people who are kind of close to it, you know, uh, have a sense of it maybe. People don't appreciate just what a massive uh, enterprise it is in a way now, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and one problem here is that liberals and their friends of mine, and I, no, I don't think I fell for this, but they three years ago, four years ago, people were going into the Trump administration, and a lot of liberal friends of mine, and there were some of them were decent people, or members of Congress were sort of sucking up to Trump Republicans, and friends of mine were saying, well, "What are they doing? Don't they understand this will kill them? This will kill their long term prospects. They're going to disgrace themselves. Mm-hmm. So the taint will be so great." And I remember saying, "I don't know. Maybe, maybe it should be." But I'm not so sure. Maybe they'll do this for a year or two. They'll be Trump's press secretary. And you know what? They'll come about, out of it with speaking engagements and with uh, Fox News contracts. And then my, my liberal friend would say, well, but they won't be really acceptable and, you know, a respectable company. Uh, to which the answer is, A, at some point, the kind of Fox News, et cetera, bubble becomes big enough that it's its own respectable little world where you can do very well. And B, it's not even true. I don't think that they're excluded from respectable company, you know? I mean, here the business world and the celebrity world and stuff is in a way almost too tolerant, you know? I mean, you can you can have just lied for a year or done pretty outrageous yeah. things for a year and, and you know, you, you still... Uh, get invited to speak to corporations and maybe to be on a couple of boards. Maybe maybe they're the boards of the right wingers, mm-hmm. not not the you know not Coca Cola or something. But I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm struck how much people. If you're a young person without any scruples, without much in the way of principles, it's not obvious to me that you don't think you know being Trumpist is a pretty good path up. I think I'm going to start climbing that ladder. You know, so that means that there's a lot of people out there climbing that ladder. You know, it's not just about a random bunch of people who signed on with Trump at the beginning, not a bunch of diehards. Uh, that is a subject that uh, uh, there are going to be a lot of uh, academic papers and a lot yeah. of books written about and a lot of research. Just how how uh, the American people did put up with so much, right, and being willing to tolerate so much and excuse so much. Um, and just look at the all this second thinking about January 6th, you know, right. even the idea that somebody could get away with saying, 
this wasn't so bad. It was just another day of tourism, you know, in the in the capital. I mean, unthinkable that somebody could say that and uh, and get away with it. Which leads me, I guess, to my wrap up question, Bill. I mean, you and I have been around this political system a long time. I know a lot of people today who really are very smart people, but really pessimistic that our democracy can survive or will survive. Are you? I mean, I'm worried. I'm not pessimistic. And these things can change. And they do tend to be somewhat cyclical. And it's sort of like the stock market. When everyone's bearish, you should buy. And when everyone's bullish, you should sell. You know, They're in the late 70s, everyone said, oh, my God, we're all falling apart. And you know, we won the civil, we won the Cold War, and we had Reagan, and we had Clinton, pretty successful administrations, and so forth. So, um, I, you know, I, I no, I think there's plenty of possibility of recovery. Plenty of uh, we have plenty of strengths. I mean, we are a very impressive country in so many ways. Uh, we have you know, so, uh, technology and the, the business world, a ton of strengths. The military is extremely impressive. I think immigrants is such a huge strength. One reason I've become so even more kind of liberal on immigration. It's just this is a huge comparative advantage of ours over so much of the rest of the world. Um, so no, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic, but the, the institutions need to be strengthened and reconstructed and people need to be, you know, we to f- be able to help people get reoriented towards them in a healthy way. And I am struck among some young people, the, the, the charm of the kind of extremism, the radicalism more on the right, I'd say, but somewhat on the left a little, a little bit you know, is, is dangerous. I mean, that people are sort of tempted to, uh, who needs all that old fashioned free speech and due process yeah, and right. rule of law stuff. And it's much more exciting to be toying with, you know, like the allure of a kind of uh, the fascism of the right, or as I say, there's less of it on the left, but a certain amount of that on the left too. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I worry. It's, it's good to be alarmed and worried, I think. And there's a lot of work to be done, especially on the Republican side, but then it's very important that liberals govern well, and, and which for me means you know in a, often in a somewhat moderate way and thoughtful way. And, uh, and I, I'm a little encouraged about that. I don't know about you, what you think about the, your your party there, the Democrats, but I think they're doing okay. Don't you think so? Bill Press talking with Bill Crystal, editor at large of The Bulwark. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressPods.com. And that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible Eric Loomis, Jane McAlevey, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.